Oh, I wish I was In a land of cotton Old times that are not forgotten Look away, look away Look away stock car racing. NASCAR's Winston Cup. There's nothing quite like it on the international sports scene. The best way to document the evolution of the most popular form of motor sports is to start from the beginning with the dream of William Henry Getty France. Big Bill, the founding father of the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, NASCAR. The top athletes on today's highly competitive Winston Cup circuit can bank more than $2 million prize money in a single season, something even Big Bill France would have thought impossible 40 years ago, back when he was molding his dream into reality. The love France embraced for automobile racing was ignited in his teens when he was growing up in Washington, D.C. He was keenly interested in the activities at the old Washington Baltimore Speedway, the legendary one and an eighth mile board oval in nearby Laurel, Maryland. It was on the hard packed sands of Daytona Beach where the magic of Bill France's imagination began to really take shape. France had moved his young family with wife Anne and son Bill Jr. to what is now known as the world's most famous beach in the days before World War II. And when the war to end all wars was over, he had already established himself as the promoter of the old beach races and a leading spokesman for a rough and tumble endeavor called stock car racing. For France, it had to be American-made sedans, Fords, Chryslers, Chevrolets, along with Plymouths, Mercury's, and Hudson Hornets, something the working man could relate to. Cars that were relatively inexpensive, easy to repair, and equal in size, power, and speed to guarantee the best in competition. France called his contemporaries together for a December conference in the Ebony Lounge at Daytona's Streamline Hotel in 1947. Oh, it's all part of history now. But when the busy three-day gathering adjourned, this nation was headed for a totally new insight on auto racing. And within a couple of months, it had a spanky new sanctioning body to make sure the sport would work. NASCAR was off and running. NASCAR's infancy was filled with one-night stands at country fairs and dusty bull rings that dotted the nation, particularly the Southland, but the sport was growing fast. 
There was one big event in the beginning, the beach course races that France promoted on the sands of Daytona. Buddy Baker recalls those early days. I remember my dad racing and I'd watch him go down the beach and then I'd run like crazy through the palmetto bushes over and watch him come back down the blacktop and uh, if he run uh, 500 miles, I run 500 miles back and forth across to watch him uh, run and it was actually a, a, an asphalt show, a dirt show and a, a speed show. Even back then they run 135, 40 miles an hour and that's getting it done. And, uh, in a 44. It's just something that I, I'll always remember, even though the racetrack's been gone for years and years. Uh, it had a special place, just like Daytona does now. Daytona Beach, 1951. Telesports cameras moved to Daytona Beach, Florida, where hundreds of stock car racing fans from all over the nation gathered for the Grand National Circuit 160-mile championship race for stock model automobiles. The nation's outstanding race drivers, behind the wheels of a dozen different makes of new cars, will be after a rich $1,200 purse. Frank Lupton, U.S. dirt track champion, holds an envious, handicapped position. Johnny Mance, the boy who copped the rich $25,000 Darlington race, will pilot car number 98. The greatest of contemporary drivers and winner of the 49 Indianapolis Classic, Bill Holland, will be after another prize for his crowded trophy room. Monty Flock of Hapeville, Georgia, along with brother Tim, are a pair of reckless rebels who hold the distinction of pre-race favorites. A field of over 50 new cars are readied and tuned for the starter signal. And the drivers jockey into their handicapped starting position during the preliminary tour of the course. The crowd is tense as the green flag signals the start of the 40-lap grind. Tim Flock, Billy Blair, and Marshall Teague lead the roaring mechanical herd around the first turn and into the backstretch sand dune. Bill Holland, after getting off to a blazing start, is forced to call it a day when a broken camshaft forces his early elimination. At the halfway point, the Flock brothers, Tim and Fonty, hold a commanding lead, but Daytona's own Marshall Teague moves up to challenge the front runners. On the 34th lap, Teague in car number six steps on on the gas and away from all competition. Just as in the previous day's event, the action gets rough and tumble in the final laps, and the dangerous south turn almost claims a trio of victims. Into the final lap, and under the checkered flag comes Marshall Teague, logging a winner's time of one hour, 36 minutes, and averaging a blistering 82.4 miles per hour. Yes, local boy makes good. In the 1951 Grand Circuit stock car race, Daytona's Marshall Teague takes on the cash award and congratulations from the missus. Before 1950, NASCAR was restricted to short tracks, few of which were made of asphalt. The hulking automobiles that were little more than souped up passenger cars plowed up clouds of dust on many a dirt track in the south. It was always fun, it was always exciting, but in 1950, it evolved dramatically. Harold Brasington, a businessman and dreamer, who'd been to Indianapolis to see the Indy 500, hatched the notion that a big track, an honest-to-goodness super speedway, could be built in his hometown of Darlington, South Carolina. His dream came true, and in 1950, Darlington International Raceway came into existence. The Southern 500 of that year marked the birth of the super speedway for NASCAR. Seventy men, 70, ran that first Southern 500. A race won by Johnny Mance in a Plymouth. He drove to the track on race morning, beating Fawdy Flock, whose racing uniform was a keen set of Bermuda shorts. Less than 10 years later, Bill France accomplished another goal. In 1959, he opened Daytona International Speedway. Something entirely new. Racing had never seen the likes of it. A mammoth 2.5 mile in distance track its turns bank 31 degrees, and drivers soon learned that a shoe never had to touch the brake. 
Daytona offered the sternest test of a man's metal because he and his car could achieve speeds never reached before. When the Daytona 500 made its debut in 1959, NASCAR and stock car racing were never to be the same. Chevys, Pontiacs, Oldsmobiles, Plymouths and Fords, convertibles and hardtops, racing at a blistering pace. It was the scene of one of the closest finishes in the annals of motorsports as three cars, side by side, charged for the checkered flag. Johnny Bochamp was declared the winner and received the accolades in victory lane. Only after days of studying film and photographs were the official results announced. Lee Petty had won the first annual Daytona 500. Lee Petty had already earned the reputation of being a winner, a strong competitor at any racetrack at any car where the number 42 was painted on its side. In 1955 in Jacksonville, Florida, he was in a tight duel with the number three Hornet driven by Dick Rath. When the green flag fell for the start, Lee Petty got down to business. Lee was one of the toughest competitors in the game back then. He drove to win, a pioneer when it came to hard charging. He didn't let anything stand in his way, not even his young son Richard, who found that out the hard way. In the late 50s, young Richard finally took the checkered flag, the winner, overjoyed with his first win in NASCAR competition. But there was confusion in the scoring tower. A protest was lost. The scoring cards rechecked, and the new winner announced. The victory went to the driver who protested the finish, Lee Petty. Gee, thanks, Dad. Welcome to Big Time Racing, son. Lee Petty won this race and 53 others. But with the highs of winning, there are also the lows. Daytona 1961, midway through the race, turn four. One of the most devastating crashes ever seen at Daytona as Lee Petty and Johnny Beauchamp leave the track. As bad as it looked, Lee Petty returned to race again. Today you'll occasionally find Lee in the pits following his son Richard's or his grandson Kyle's exploits, or more likely, on a local golf course. During the 70s, he even gave sports announcing a try. Uh, Richard, being out there running a race like this year, and when you got all the competition go, what? Well, how do you feel when uh, you're about to win the race and got four or five laps to go? Well, it always feels good. It feels better when you go ahead and win it. But uh, you know, a lot of times when uh, you get that close, things can happen just uh, just as if you got still got four or five hundred miles to go. You're trying to tell me, in other words, you're not satisfied to run in a 500-mile race until you get the checkered flag, and uh, then you know you won it. That's right. The, the rest of the time is just more or less for exercise. We just go out there and run around, and, uh, you know, if we're there when it's over, it's what counts. Well, I just can't go along with just a lot of exercise out there. It looks to me like going out there on a real hot day, you'll lose maybe 8 or 10 pounds, and that's just a little over-exercising yourself, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Uh, I lay around a whole lot during the week, so, uh, you know, one day uh, job uh, a week is not too bad. So, well, uh, well, I go along when you lay around a whole lot because a lot of times you don't get up at 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning and don't come to work a little late. Uh, now, what's the deal on that? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, just as long as I can get there on race day and uh, do my job and wind up winning the race now and then, then... Uh, I don't think that uh, any of us got a whole lot of complaints. Well, the name of the game is to win races, and uh, I, I've always been a real big fan of Lee Petty, and now I've changed all that, and now I'm a big fan of Richard Petty. Well, I hope so. Uh, it works out better for both of us that way right now. It, mean, it means more money in the pocketbook, don't it? It really does. Uh, when it comes to paying the taxes and everything, it's, it's better if one of us is working. In 1969, Bill France completed what was known as the ultimate super speedway. Alabama International Motor Speedway at Talladega. It had the same general appearance as Daytona, but it was banked a little steeper, it was a little longer, and it was faster. This fast, it's the fastest racetrack we've got. It's the fastest racetrack in the world, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, racing is a game of speed, and uh, I guess that's really the reason I like to run a place like Talladega. The race itself is a spectacle. Uh, just being here and being a part of it is a—it's a thrill. And to me, it's a—it's a great racetrack. It's a—it's a good test of machinery and a good test of driving. It's an experience of a lifetime. Bill France explains how Talladega came to be. 
We uh, received a phone call from Governor Wallace after a group of these wonderful folks here in Talladega County had taken the trouble to go down to explain what they wanted. They wanted a facility similar to Daytona and better if possible that would bring worldwide recognition to people here in Alabama. Because of its size and 33 degree banking, stock cars have reached dizzying speeds. The once magic 200 mile per hour barrier has been broken repeatedly within its walls, but the first to do it was Buddy Baker in 1970. For two years since construction of the mammoth two and two thirds mile Alabama International Motor Speedway was started, drivers have dreamed of breaking the 200 mile per hour average speed mark. In the 10 months since the track opened for testing, Many have come near, but none have succeeded until Buddy Baker grabbed a chunk of history and drove this Dodge Daytona Charger to a new official world record of 200.447 miles an hour during a NASCAR-sanctioned run. Are you happy? You bet you. Well, we worked real hard today, and this Dodge car really produced for me, and I'm real happy. Goodyear trying a new tire that they're bringing in to Talladega here, and it worked perfect all the way through the run. The 200 mile an hour run was not an end in itself, however. The test in which Baker established the speed record was a final tune-up for the Alabama 500 mile race here April 12th, when 40 stock cars challenge each other on this speedway, the fastest anywhere, for a $134,000 purse. Speed records of every type have been set at Alabama International Speedway. In trucks, Johnny Ray and this 18-wheeler averaged over 92 miles an hour, which made him the truck driver's champ. His accomplishment was broadcast coast to coast on the Truckers Interstate CB network before the engine in that big Kenworth had time to cool off. A.J. Foyt gave everyone a target to shoot for when he brought his Indy car to these five-story high bank turns and ran at over 217 miles an hour. The late Mark Donahue left his mark on the record books in 1975 when he established a closed course record of over 221 miles an hour eclipsing Foyt's mark. And how was it traveling at those speeds? <laughs> how was it out there? Well, we've worked a long time to get to this point, and it's really a, it's a great thrill to have this kind of a record in, in the Penske Racing Team. I'm really, really happy. The first man to break 200 miles an hour in a stock car, Buddy Baker, also seemed to have a lock on victory lane through the mid-70s. No more, and they're coming up on the white flag. There it is. One more lap to go, and the crowd is delirious. Because now, David Pearson is beginning to close. The Silver Fox is famous for last lap finishes. Now, can he do it? With $25,000 on the win spot, both cars are wound to the limit. Tack needles way over the red line. Two four-wheeled missiles are screaming down the back chute, and David is closing. There have been 52 lead changes thus far. David Pearson is trying desperately to make it 53. There goes the slingshot out of the dog leg. But he can't do it. Buddy Baker wins the fifth annual Winston 500. David Pearson has to settle for second. Dick Brooks takes third and Darrell Waltrip finishes fourth. Buddy Baker picks up his new crew and heads for victory lane. Owner and crew chief Bud Moore tips his hat to a champion. David Pearson has won this race three times. Today, Buddy Baker beat the master of Talladega in a flat-out, no holds barred run for the wire. Out of eight super speedway victories, Buddy said this was the greatest win in his career. It's always a great day when you visit victory lane, but as Buddy Baker had peaked on this day, he also had seen the valleys, like in 1968 at Martinsville. The field was made up of the best in NASCAR. Pearson, Petty, Bobby Isaac, Cale Yarborough, Pete Hamilton, Leroy Yarborough, and Darrell Derringer. 
Driving the white Dodge number three, Buddy started on the outside of the front row alongside the Wood Brothers number 21 Mercury, driven by Cale Yarborough. As they entered the first turn, there was mayhem as the two front-running machines came together. Baker headed for the pits with front-end damage along with Kale, who also needed service. Suddenly, Baker was scrambling for the safety of the pit wall. Buddy escaped without injury, but it was just one of those days when he should have stayed in bed. The number 43 Plymouth of Richard Petty went on to win that day, one of 15 500 lap victories he would register at Martinsville, Virginia. Buddy Baker, the man they call the gentle giant from Charlotte, North Carolina, is an aggressive charger on the track, but when he's out of his race car, he's known for his warm personality, his charming wit. The one-liners never seem to stop around Baker's garage, and he can even laugh at himself. I'll tell you how bad a road racer I was, he jokes. I raced for seven years at Riverside, California, before I found out the S-turns were paid. Every year in February at Daytona Speed Weeks, many young aspiring drivers with little or no experience show up, determined to build an instant reputation. It's a situation that prompted Buddy to once say, this is like the first day at school. Who are all these new kids? And Baker remembers when he was a kid. He was 13 when his father won the 1953 Southern 500 at Darlington. But he remembered, long after the victory celebration was over, I walked across the track, sat down under the flags. I knew right then that my dream would come true and I would win this race. 17 years later, Buddy won the 1970 Southern 500. Buddy Baker came from a racing background. His dad, Buck, came up by doing battle in the 50s with the likes of Lee Petty and Curtis Turner. One of those tracks was on the outskirts of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the famed Mile at Langhorne. Did you ever wonder how your car would do in racing competition in the hands of a good race driver? Come with us and find out as we take you to the Langhorne Speedway, the world's fastest circular mile track to watch a National Grand Circuit Championship for late model stock cars. At the Langhorn Speedway, the country's top drivers prepare to take off on a 150-mile chase for fame and fortune. Mechanics make the final adjustments on their cars for the grueling grind ahead. Because of rain, no time trials were held, so drivers draw for starting position. With everything in readiness, the pace car leads the contestants around the one-mile circular track. As the cars hit the head of the straightaway, the crowd comes to its feet for the start of the race. The way they roar, 39 cars in all, flashing past the starter's flag on the first leg of this 150-lap battle. Herb Thomas, the holder of the Langhorn track record for 150 miles, sets the early pace. But after 13 miles, a flat tire forces him into the pits for repair. The journey Buck Baker followed to back-to-back -back Winston Cup titles in the mid-50s was unique, to say the least. From a job driving a city bus in Charlotte, all the way to the top of the sport. And it's not recorded just how many skid marks he left at the corner bus stop, or just how many passengers he put into shock with his driving style in city traffic. Hitting nearly 100 miles per hour, the drivers are setting a record-breaking pace. On the 82nd lap, Buck Baker at the wheel of car number 87 pushes his throttle to the floor and zooms into the lead. Buck was Baker a tough-as-leather, do-it-yourself kind of guy, fought for every inch of the racetrack, and one of the first drivers in the early days to fly his own airplane. Disregard the fact that he never bothered to get a pilot's license. His flight routes were determined by the maps from local gas stations. He'd follow the highways from Charlotte east to the Atlantic coast, turn right, head south until he saw Daytona Beach. And the only instrument that really mattered was the fuel gauge. 
the rest of them didn't really seem to make a lot of sense to him. Buck spent a lot of time stranded at small backwater out of the way landing strips because the weather had to be perfectly clear for his navigational plans to work. It's Lee Petty and Buck Baker battling it out for the top spot. Just 13 laps to go, Buck Baker pours on the pole and goes into the lead with Lee Petty coming fast. Today, Buck Baker owns and operates a very successful high-performance driving school at Rockingham's North Carolina Motor Speedway. At the finish, it's Buck Baker blazing by the checkered flag, the winner. Lee Petty a second with Monty Blockner. Baker traveled the 150-mile course in two hours, three minutes, 43 and three-tenths seconds to establish a new Langhorn Speedway record. Baker's victory earned top prize money. The Langhorn Trophy and the big kiss from his proud and pretty wife. Another man who had a driver's school back in the 60s was the legendary Curtis Turner. <laughs> There's not a vocabulary large enough to cover his exploits. If there was a true daredevil in those rough and tumble days, it was Turner. In the early days of the sport, Turner was the subject of enough off-track legends to keep a Hollywood scriptwriter busy for months. There's a story about the time he piloted his small private plane to a stop at a neighborhood street in a small South Carolina town. He ran quickly into the home of a friend, returned to the cockpit with a bottle of bourbon, and promptly flew off into the wild blue yonder. Some of his old pals say it was standard procedure for Turner to take off in his plane for a race, switch the fuel to the reserve tank, punch in the automatic pilot, and then take a nap. When the reserve tank emptied, the engine would sputter, thus waking him up. And fully refreshed, Curtis would switch to the main fuel tank, take over the controls, and be on his way. The FAA would have loved Curtis Turner. Late in his colorful career, he became a driving force and one of the founding fathers of the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Today, the Charlotte Motor Speedway is called the Taj Mahal of NASCAR, and indeed it is pretty. The grounds are spectacular with a gleaming high-rise tower, luxurious VIP suites, and even condominiums. But don't be fooled. This one-and-a-half-mile dogleg track might be smaller than Daytona and Tel Aviv and speeds might not be as high, but woe to the driver who was lulled by Charlotte's appearance. It demands the highest driver concentration and car performance to get a win here. In 1961, a stellar field of cars came down for the green flag. proved to be a test of endurance and survival. With a lap and a half to go, David Pearson was leading by three laps over Fireball Roberts when he blew a tire. Instead of heading for the pits to change it, he limped and smoked around the track at 30 miles an hour as the hard-charging Fireball Roberts sliced away at the lead. Fireball almost made it, but Pearson crossed the finish line first to claim his first Winston Cup victory. Next for David Pearson was the victory lane celebration, the race queen, and the kiss, and kiss, and kiss. But this was not by a long shot, the end to David Pearson's winning ways at Charlotte. The white flag, one more lap to complete the longest stock car race in the world. And it's now or never for Richard Petty. He has that Dodge wound out all the way. Entering turn three, he begins to set Pearson up for the slingshot. But can he pull it off? On to the trial, both cars are flat out. Petty can't make it, and David Pearson flies under the checkered flag. Winner of the 15th World 600. David Pearson's personal mode of transportation has changed dramatically from the time he was driving star for such famous teams as Ray Fox, Cotton Owens, Holman Moody, the Wood Brothers. He started with a single-engine plane and graduated to this Aero Commander. Today, he flies his own helicopter to the NASCAR races. 
In the 60s, David Pearson had a lousy reputation as a road racer. Being a factory back driver, factory officials knew it. So they shipped him a brand new streetcar with a standard four-speed transmission to use in the off-season. The ploy worked. Pearson opened the following year by winning the road race in Riverside, California. Pearson was always one of the coolest and smoothest drivers in the game that saw him notch 105 Winston Cup victories, second only to Richard Petty, and 113 pole positions, including 10 in a row at Charlotte Motor Speedway in the 70s. When a team of doctors decided to monitor a few of the top drivers in the scorching hot Southern 500 at Darlington one Labor Day, they were astounded to discover that Pearson's pulse rate actually decreased in the heat of competition. You've got to relax when you're out there trying to win. That was his simple explanation. And win he did, three Winston Cup championships. But in any driver's career, there is always that time when he let one slip away. In 1975, Pearson was leading the Daytona 500 comfortably with only three laps to go. He got into trouble, spun down the back chute. This enabled Benny Parsons to go on to record his only win in the Daytona 500. Is David Pearson a better driver in his own mind than he was back in the factory days, maybe 10 years ago? Well, I don't, wouldn't say that I'm any better. Uh, I feel like it, uh, I do a little bit more figuring and uh, smarter, other words, as far as running the race. I feel like it, uh, I try to figure out uh, what's happening and what other people's doing more than I did then. Back then, uh, all I knew was just uh, run wide open, that's racing, and try to lead every lap and hope that you'd be leading at the end. But uh, it didn't take me too many years to find out that that's not the way to win a race. The 1976 Daytona 500 produced one of the most incredible finishes in racing history. Pearson, the Silver Fox, and the King Richard Petty, the top two all-time winners in a classic showdown. The final lap of this $343,000 event. Petty has the Dodge in front, but now the persistent Pearson begins to reel Petty in. Down the long back chute, David Pearson once again claims the lead as he puts the hammer down. Both cars wound over their limits, tack needles in the red, two flying hand grenades, and a frantic run for a checkered flag. At turn four, the volcano erupts. Petty's Dodge slithering, sliding to a halt just a scant few feet from the checkered flag. He's unable to restart the engine. Pearson's car still running as he brings the crippled Mercury through the dust and across the finish line for the most spectacular win in stock car history. The Silver Fox won, but the victory seemed to take its toll. Soon after, there was talk of David Pearson and retirement. Is it still fun? Yeah, and any time you win, it's fun. And, of course, I'd have to say that uh, it's not as much fun to me as it was 10 years ago because 10 years ago I'd have jumped in the car and run it for nothing. Just get to say I drove Red Brothers Mercury. But uh, I enjoy racing, and uh, I think when I get to where I don't enjoy it, I'll quit. The marriage came to an end in 1979 at Darlington when a miscommunication between Pearson and the crew spelled disaster. Pearson left the pits after the crew changed the two right side tires, not realizing it was a four tire change. He never made it to the end of pit road. Pit stops are a vital part of racing. It's where the teamwork comes into play. To the uninitiated, it may look like controlled chaos.
chips are such a key to winning in NASCAR that Unical started a pit stop competition. Beginning in 1967 at North Carolina Motor Speedway, the greatest crews are gathered once a year to do battle and try to lay claim to the title of the fastest crew in NASCAR. Unical involvement in NASCAR began under the banner of Pure Oil in 1951 when Marshall T, a Pure Oil distributor, put the name of the company on the side of his race car. The results were rewarding. The corporate leaders took notice, began to supply gasoline and oil along the circuit. Unical is still the official gasoline of NASCAR and the pit crew competition is still as intense as ever. Pit stops are a frenzy of activity but in slow motion, these mechanical magicians perform a high-speed ballet. Then, there are those days when things don't go quite as planned. It's enough to bring even a grizzled veteran to tears. It was only logical that as stock car racing grew, it would draw attention. Perhaps no attention was more favorable than that given it by the automotive leaders in Detroit. They soon got wind of what was going on. It fascinated them to learn that when a particular car model won a race on Sunday, its sales curve went up on Monday. The lure was too much, and by the mid-50s and through the 60s, the auto manufacturers took to stock car racing with gusto. They formed teams, hired drivers, set up shops in the South. Their technical and financial assistance was a boon to NASCAR because stock car racing was receiving the best Detroit had to offer. It was Ford against General Motors, against Chrysler. When one was more victorious than the other, the other responded with a new car, a new engine, or some mechanical gimmick anything to make the cars go faster, endure longer, sell better. And stock car racing's technical sophistication grew in quantum leaps. Well, I think what happened, uh, you know, we went along there for years and years and everybody sort of did everything in their backyard and then uh, in uh, the middle 50s, uh, the factories got into it, uh, you know, General Motors and, and Ford and, uh, and Chrysler got into it and then they, they sort of up the technology for two or three years and then they pulled out but they left that technology with all the boys that worked on the cars and they saw better ways then and they started experimenting with things and uh, then the factories got back into it but, uh, I think uh, in the mid 60s and, uh, and got everything going and then they got out of it in uh, 69 or 70 and 
then that's when the sponsorship really started to come in uh, with STP and, and Winston and all the other people really started pouring money into the race and then and uh, they sort of took advantage of the technology that the factories had left and then when they put no more money in it then we were able to hire smarter people and, and had more more time to work on the car and more people working on the car so uh, really I guess the beginning uh, of the, the technology and, uh, and the sponsorship deal now started uh, 70, 71, somewhere along there. Sure, there were problems. NASCAR had to do its best to keep the competition as fair as possible, and sometimes its rules led to foot stomping and pouting from Detroit, or on more than one occasion, abandonment of the sport altogether. Nevertheless, Factory teams were the stars for nearly two decades. Inevitably, a gentleman emerges in professional sports just when it's least expected. And in Major League stock car racing at that time, that athlete was Ned Jarrett. The handsome North Carolina competitor grabbed back-to-back -back late model sportsman national driving championships in 1957 and 58. And two years later, he moved up to capture the first of two coveted Winston Cup titles. Jarrett, another of the popular stars on the rapidly growing NASCAR scene in the early 60s, is now enshrined in the National Motorsports Press Association's Hall of Fame at Darlington, South Carolina. But he's never left the sport. Glenn and Dale Jarrett, Ned's strapping sons, have both worked hard to build a driving career. Young Dale runner-up in the 1988 Rookie of the Year competition. Ned is now an award-winning motorsports commentator, best known as part of the CBS Emmy award-winning team. Well, that's it from the garage area. Now back to the Motor Racing Network in the tower. No driver ever roared into NASCAR's domain with more impact than fearless Freddy Lorenzen, a race car driving carpenter from Elmhurst, Illinois. A first worth more than $28,600 awaits the first place finisher of this event for late model stocks. And with the fastest field ever to enter the Daytona 500, it should be one of the most exciting races ever. Junior Johnson is one of the pre-race favorites and will be in the second full position with a 65 Ford. But he'll receive plenty of competition from Darrell Derringer, who qualified for the number one full position with a red-hot 64 Mercury. You can never discount the chances of Fred Lorenzen, who drives a 65 Ford and is one of the outstanding stock jockeys of all time. He was the golden boy in the Ford-backed Holman Moody operation based in Charlotte, North Carolina. He became the first driver in the sports history to win more than $100,000 in a single season, 1963. And during the following year, he raced in 16 events, won eight of them, an excellent batting average in any league. Now a member of the Stock Car Hall of Fame, Lorenzen was the first driver to post wins on all of the original five super speedways. And when he retired, he had more major victories in events of 250 miles or more than any driver then on the record book. More than 40 late model cars take the green flag under threatening skies. If rain should interrupt this race, the driver, who's in first place at the time, will be declared the winner. There's no tomorrow, so much of the pre-race strategy calls for going to the front, then trying to stay there. Here's Patch coming into the pits. Lorenzen moves into the front running position while the pit crew of Marvin Patch works feverishly on his car. Lorenzen pours on the speed while Patch... He was only 33 pit. when he retired from the sport, but he followed his heart. When he and his wife Nancy were married and settled down in Elmhurst to raise a family, that famous pearl white racing helmet went to a permanent resting place in the attic. Today, Lorenzen is one of the leading real estate brokers in the Chicago area, and his business card identifies him as a lifetime member of the $7 million club. Fred Lorenzen of Elmhurst, Illinois, is declared the winner. The abbreviated race is worth $28,600 to the Husky Blonde, who holds the record for money won by a stock car driver in a single year. 
Another highly successful stock car driver emerged from the pine thickets and palmetto scrubs near Jacksonville, Florida in the early 60s in another factory-backed Ford. And by the time the decade was over, he'd left his mark on the stock car racing record books like none other. In 1969, for example, among his seven super speedway victories were wins in the Daytona 500, the World 600 at Charlotte, and the fabled Southern 500 at Darlington, then stock car racing's version of the Triple Crown. Drivers today don't call it the Triple Crown, it's called the Winston Million. Leroy Yarbrough chalked up 14 major victories in a career cut short by illness. By the end of the 60s, Ulbricht factory backing was gone. It was a matter of expense. Ah, <laughs> but don't be fooled. Detroit's interest in NASCAR is as keen today as ever. Factory backing is still with us. You just have to look a little harder to find it. When the auto manufacturers closed their wallets, at least as far as individual team support was concerned, there evolved a new milestone in stock car racing. As it grew, it attracted more and more fans. Hence came the sponsors. Oh sure, teams had sponsors before. Their cars were adorned with the names of various products, service stations, even a dog track or two. The funding was minuscule. Soon, however, sponsorship became a major part of racing. So much so that today any team with any hope of victory bears the name of a national product or service with money to match. If there is any one factor in the fantastic growth of NASCAR through the 70s and 80s, it was the entry of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company into the sports marketing field in 1971. Reynolds, with its Winston brand, became the first major non-automotive sponsor in stock car racing. Product and service companies like Gatorade, Pepsi-Cola, Piedmont Airlines soon followed suit and began to sponsor cars. With Reynolds' involvement came the Winston Cup circuit and an infusion of dollars that, among other things, made the point fund irresistible to competitors. They could earn more money than ever before, and that, coupled with the ever-increasing number of sponsors, has made stock car racing a wealthy sport indeed. Today, the Winston Cup point fund alone is worth $2 million. In 1985, R.J. Reynolds added a unique new wrinkle, the Winston. Well, the Winston is a short race that uh, is really an exciting thing for us. It's an awful lot of money for just a few miles of racing. Uh, it's a race that uh, can only be entered by people that, that uh, have won the right to enter it by winning a race in the previous year. And it's a concept that I think we'll probably see more of down the road by other companies. In addition to sponsoring Talladega's Winston 500 and California's Winston Western 500, they created the Winston. The Winston, an instant success. It's NASCAR's version of baseball's All-Star Game and football's Pro Bowl. The Winston is a spectacular, flat-out, no-holds-barred, high-speed scramble for winners only. In this one, they only race a short distance and the winner takes more than $200,000 to the bank. I just think it's an indication of how strong this sport has become, and uh, I think we're really on the tip of the iceberg. I think we're going to see more and more races, special events that pit the stars of the sport against each other for large amounts of money in short races. And I couldn't have picked a better time to be in stock car racing because it's really a, a very lucrative sport and a very successful sport at this time. It was a grand affair, and when the checkered flag fell on the first Winston, it was Darrell Waltrip that pulled into victory lane. But it wasn't the first time. As a matter of fact, it had become quite a habit. The last lap of an Alabama International Motor Speedway 500 is traditionally a shootout, a quartet here to decide it all. The white and green colors of young and talented Darrell Waltrip leads the pack followed by Alabama's own Donnie Allison running in second, and the 1976 national champion Cale Yarborough third, with 1975 Daytona 500-mile champion Parsons running forth as they come to the line through the trioval and down for the last lap. As they move across the line, it is Darrell Waltrip in the lead. 
Joe Allison ready to challenge in second. Then, in turn one, Waltrip is going to break the draft. He's dropping his Chevrolet all the way to the bottom of the speedway. He falls ahead by eight, nine, car lengths. Out of turn number two, the lead disintegrates as Allison pulls Yarbrough along in the draft. Donnie Allison goes high to pass Waltrip, loses. Yarbrough comes up the inside, goes by Allison. Now he moves to the outside of the track on the outer edge of control. Tires smoldering. Yarbrough goes for the lead. Waltrip fights him off. Parsons drops to the inside from fourth. He slams in the side of Cale Yarbrough. Out of turn number four. Again, Yarbrough and Parsons put the wrap on each other for second place. Darrell Waltrip pulls away. Three cars side by side for second. At the line as they go to the tri-oval. It will be Darrell Waltrip winning his greatest race and nearly a dead heat for second between Benny Parsons and Cale Yarbrough. We're into the last lap with three leaders still jammed together. Darrell Walter goes high in turn one. Richard Petty looks for daylight underneath. He's alongside. It's a drag race to the finish line. Allison in third, blocked. He has nowhere to go. Down the back stretch, the final two turns. Petty can't hold the STP car low. Here comes Waltrip underneath. Waltrip has the lead. After 367 laps, this has come down to a 100-yard dash. Who's it going to be? Allison tries the inside. Darrell Waltrip wins the Rebel 500. I'd like to come across the line one time by myself. I don't know what it's like. Often humorous, sometimes a bit outspoken, but rarely silent. Darrell Waltrip dominated the scene in the early 80s, both on and off the track. And his articulate wit and quick sense of humor prompted his fellow competitors to nickname him Jaws. Who do you think you are? I'm not sure. Just because you won a few races on a sportsman circuit, that don't give you the right to come down here and run all over this man's racetrack and wreck these cars. You got any comment? Ain't you got anything to say? You don't have to get bossy. You Yankees are all alike. You don't have to get bossy. never know what to say. Back to the tower. Darrell Waltrip roared into Winston Cup racing like a strong, fresh breeze in the early 70s when he started as an independent. When he joined Junior Johnson in 1981 and won the first of three national titles for that legendary team owner, he was squarely at the top of his game. It was his successful title run against veteran Bobby Allison in 1981 that carried him to center stage as he clinched the championship at the last race of the season in Riverside, California. In 1987, it is Waltrip's name ahead of every other race driver in history in the Money One column. Waltrip gave a lot of credit to the monarch of Pitt Road, Junior Johnson. He's so cool. He's so darn cool. He sits there on, in the pit with his foot up on the pit wall with that headset on, and it, if the car is two laps ahead or if it's two laps behind, the, the expression's the same. He's not. He never changes. He's... He is the steadying force in that entire racing team. Uh, it is one of the best, well, it is the best car in NASCAR. And Junior is the smartest man in NASCAR. And I think he proves it week in and week out. When you got good men working for you, you don't have to be much of a boss. Junior is a lot like E.F. Hutton. When he speaks, I listen, and I think a lot of other people do too. No former driver has ever better prepared to start his own racing operation than the fabled mountain man from rural Wilkes County in the Blue Ridge foothills of North Carolina. When the checkered flag fell on the second annual Daytona 500 back in 1960, it was Junior Johnson in victory lane. And before he retired his helmet to start his own team in 1966, he had 50 Winston Cup wins in the book. As a car owner, He's established records that are the envy of everyone on Pip Road. Junior Johnson is indeed one of America's genuine heroes. Daytona, Talladega, Charlotte, the super speedways of NASCAR. Men. And one of them
one winner, Ron Bouchard, dared to sing about. A lot of people ask me, Ron, now which track is your favorite one? I can't say that there's just one course for me. I like my racing long and fast, where the banks are high and there's room to pass. The super tracks are where I'd rather be. I like Darlington and Michigan, Charlotte and Daytona, Atlanta and Talladega too. Their reputation's well deserved, they're tough to tame and hard on you, but I'm gonna beat them all before I'm through. Now I enjoy those super tracks that burn that rubber on each lap. Run the straightaways at 200. Come up that turn and pass those stances loaded with those screaming fans. The super tracks the only way to go. I like Darlington and Michigan, Charlotte and Daytona, Atlanta and Talladega too. Their reputation's well deserved, they're tough to tame and hard on you, but I'm gonna beat them all before I'm through. The speedways of NASCAR are like a family, yet each member is different. Some large, some small, some forgiving, while others are most cruel. Yet there is something unique about each of them. Each speedway has its own personality, its own pitfalls, its own reputation. Spectators log thousands of miles to travel each year to see this difference, the change it causes in driving styles and strategies. They are harsh taskmasters who demand the very best from man and machine. The opening of Daytona International Speedway in 1959 launched a new era of speed for stock cars. The Daytona 500 in a single year became the great American race, began to rival the long-established Indianapolis 500 in the realm of importance. Well, uh, out of all the sports, the, the Super Bowl, the football game is the last one of the season. The World Series is their last game, but we come to Daytona Beach and play our Super Bowl and World Series, the first game of the year. The Daytona 500. It is a race that can make a season, or in some cases, a career. It builds the superstars of NASCAR. When it comes to size, Daytona does not rule. When Bill France built Alabama International Motor Speedway in 1969, he made it like Daytona, but a little bigger, a little steeper. It speeds a little faster. At 2.66 miles with 33 degree banking, the track is a real brute. It demands speed and raw nerve to conquer the world's fastest competitive closed course. At over 200 miles an hour, Dick Brooks felt the wrath of Talladega. As the car was towed away, everything destroyed. Only the roll cage enabled Dick Brooks to go out and play 18 holes of golf the next day. But an accident like that can age I, uh, a person. I, you know, I still enjoy it. It's uh, the, the enjoyment overcomes the, the fact that uh, getting a little bit older and the track's getting a little bit rougher, I think. Which is it? The tracks get rougher or you get older? Well, there's, there's, uh, it must have something to do with the age, maybe, because it, it's showing up other places other than on the racetrack. This track has always been known for fantastic finishes. Baker in front, in second, that white car, that is Kelly Arboro, and he drops to the inside. Headed to the tri-oval, side by side, A.J. Boyd comes high. It is Kelly Arboro breaking in front. Arboro pulling away by eight car lengths. Kelly Arboro will win the Alabama 500, Buddy Baker in second, A.J. Boyd finishing in third, and in fourth. Isaac Pearson and Baker scream down the back chute, heading for the white flag lap. Oh no, look out! Crawford lost it in the fourth turn, hit the wall, and when he ricocheted across the track, he tangled with the leader, Bobby Isaac. David Pearson threads his way through the mayhem to take the lead. Isaac powered his way right through Crawford, but it slowed him up enough to lose the lead. Crawford is all right and gets out of the car. And here comes David Pearson down off the high bank fourth turn onto the tri-oval for the checkered flag. 
The granddaddy of the super speedways is Darlington International Raceway, just over a mile and a third in distance. This one has never been noted for speed. No sets of turns are alike on this egg-shaped oval. Darlington is the meanest of the super speedways, and it's always been too tough to tame. In the third turn, Darrell is on him, and Bobby tries desperately to stave him off. Donnie closes. This threesome is screwed together and going for a blanket finish. Here they come. Watch it. Bobby Allison does it. In an absolutely spectacular finish, he fires under the checkered flag. Winner of the 19th annual Rebel 500, thus putting the Matador in victory lane. Two super speedways are slightly more than a mile in distance. They're the North Carolina Motor Speedway and Dover Downs International Speedway. Each is something of an oddity. These tracks are big enough to join the super speedway ranks, but small enough to inflict all the bruising punishment that comes from a short track. Make his way to the checkered flag as easily as he possibly can. Here he is, Ricky Rudd wins the Delaware 500 at Dover. Michigan International Speedway is nestled in the Irish Hills and at two miles in length with relatively little banking doesn't demand speed. What Michigan requires is skill. They run side by side, bumper to bumper, all day. Pocono International Speedway, no other speedway has such a shape. Drivers have to negotiate a tight, high bank first turn a peculiar pointed second turn, and then a flat-out, old-fashioned fairgrounds kind of corner before they can enjoy the luxury of this wide-open front straightaway. When Atlanta International Raceway was constructed in 1960, it was soon discovered that it had the biggest shoulders of any mile-and-a-half track in existence. Believe it or not, this track's turns are longer than its straightaways. They are long, sweeping, extremely treacherous. Any driver who cannot put his car high, low, or at all points in between doesn't stand a chance to beat this track. Charlotte Motor Speedway, a mile and a half dogleg hosting the longest race on the circuit, 600 miles. It's also been the scene of some bizarre record attempts. Jimmy the Flying Great Kofas set a record with this leap, one that very few people really want to challenge. In the 1940s, drivers were thundering through the half-mile ovals of dirt that made up Richmond, Martinsville, North Wilkesboro speedways. Today, they're all asphalt. In 1954, a record crowd of 8,500 people jammed the grandstands at Martinsville to watch a thundering herd of stock cars banging down that front chute. And on this very tight half mile, drivers didn't know whether they were coming or going. Drivers Jim Pascal finally survived this brutal test to take the checkered flag ahead of Lee Petty in a Chrysler and Curtis Turner in a 53 Olds 88. At the start of the 60s, a young upstart captured his second annual NASCAR Winston Cup victory. The man, Richard Petty, and in victory circle, he was a very happy driver. Under the guidance of track founder Clay Earls, Martinsville was paved in the late 50s and has become one of the most beautiful facilities on the circuit. It's become known as the little track that thinks it's a super speedway because of its large purses and its sellout crowds. Bristol International Raceway is unusual for a short track. It's just a half mile in distance, but with 36 degree bank turns, it's like a hippodrome. Necks wear out before cars do because of the constant G-forces. More relief drivers are used at Bristol than any track on the circuit. G 
Miguel Yarborough has captured nine victories on this tough half mile. And in March of 1973, he not only won, but led all 500 laps. Another milestone in NASCAR's history occurred in 1958 when Riverside International Raceway, a serpentine uphill downhill road course, was awarded a Winston Cup race. The California facility was ranked among the top courses in the world for sports car competition. But the big stock car? In the 60s, the great road racer Dan Gurney was the driver to beat. But it wasn't long before the world knew the NASCAR drivers could handle a road course as good or better than the sports car set. In the true tradition of California and Hollywood, in-car cameras were a far cry from the technology they've advanced to today. Here, Dan Gurney is charging up through the pack, caressing his way through the S's. Whoops! Cut! In 1986, the famed Watkins Glen road course returned. The bud of the Glen each year draws record crowds, and road racers the world over stand in awe of the stars of NASCAR as they manhandle this most prestigious road circuit. That's the Speedway family, a group of tracks that make up the richest racing series in America, the Winston Cup. It takes a special breed of athlete to compete week after week on so many diverse competitive fields and emerge a winner. Back in the early 60s, there was another road course that those drivers tackled, Bridgehampton. The fastest qualifier, Dick Petty, driving a 63-4. Right alongside comes Fred Lorenzen in a 63 Plymouth. Pat, pressing for his 10th stock victory of the year, leads the field in a lurch as he zooms car number 43 into a lengthy early lead. Further back, Papa Lee Petty gives chase in his Plymouth. North Carolina's Ned Jarrett is putting other pilots to shame as he bombs away in a 63 Ford Supercharger. But his belated bid to catch the leader will prove unsuccessful. Running second to Petty in car number 28, a Ford is Fred Lorenzen. The crowd strains to catch a glimpse of Dick Petty as he steers the lead car across the finish a full 25 seconds ahead of runner-up Fred Lorenzen. Petty averages 86.4 miles an hour in winning the century for his 10th stock victory of the year. A bus from race queen, Tori Fennerin, and some handsome hardware is icing on the cake for Dick Petty, jackpot winner of the Bridgehampton Grand National. What can you call a man who has won seven Winston Cup championships in 200 races far more than any other competitor? You can do no less than call him the king. And that's exactly what thousands upon thousands of stock car racing fans call Richard Petty. This is the same man who had his first Winston Cup win taken away by a protest by his father. But oh, did he make up for that time. Richard Petty has also paid the price for the thousands of miles over which he's competed. Bristol International Raceway. Darling. The famous 76 finish at Daytona. Then, just two years later, he was hooked up with his old nemesis, David Pearson, one more time, and a new nemesis, Darrell Waltrip. All the adversity and the triumphs, Richard Petty has never forgotten the backbone of NASCAR racing. The fans, the folks who clamor for his autograph, the spectators who fill the grandstands race after race to support him. If you really get right down to it, they're the ones that pay the bill. Uh, even though, say, a lot of people that's wandering around got in with a free ticket or something, they still buy my STP product or my 
Winston cigarettes or they buy Union Oil or Goodyear tires or, you know, whatever it is. And, and they still are the backbone of, of Grand National Racing because if, uh, if people don't buy our sponsorships things, then uh, we don't run. So we have to sort of please the spectators as they go along and also, uh, you know, from the they're the ones that's paying the purse also. Uh, the tracks don't pay the purse. The people that, that buy, the, buy the tickets are the ones that that really are paying our way. So they're the ones we got to look at. accident happens on a super speedway, it's usually spectacular. But it's a credit to the stringent safety rules that NASCAR has mandated to how so many drivers come away. Sure, there's bumps and bruises. At 200 miles an hour, there's always a degree of fear. Certainly, stop car racing is uh, not a safe sport, because any time you run at 200 miles an hour and the wrong thing happens, you're in a lot of trouble. But as far as a, a high-speed sport, uh, our type of race cars, I feel like are the safest in the world. You know, uh, when, when you're traveling at speeds over 200 miles an hour and uh, knowing that things can't happen, uh, there's got to be a certain amount of fear there, but you've got to be able to control it. I think courage is control fear. Anybody that's halfway normal has got fear, and uh, I have been scared to death many a times in the race cars, just like I have on the public highways or driving downtown. I know when I first started in the racing business, something in front of me would happen on the racetrack, and, and I'd get afraid, and uh, usually end up right in the middle of it. It didn't take long to learn that I, that I was getting afraid too quick. When something happened, I, I had to teach myself that when something happened on the racetrack that I was to get out of that situation and then get afraid. And that's, what's, uh, that's what I've had to train myself to do, and I think everybody else has too. Bittiger and I started out in a 10 by 50 house trailer and, uh, with absolutely zero. And, it makes you feel good to, when we leave and come back and drive up this lane and see this house that, that we built, we did it together, and, and all this farmland and, and everything else that, that we have here, and, uh, and, that, and that's all trophies too, because every bit of it came from uh, the hard work and came from the racing business, and, and working uh, uh, hard to be able to afford uh, something like this, and uh, make, makes me uh, awful, awful proud of it. It's, uh, as I say, my biggest trophy, I guess. We're racing are in war here in Charlotte. Now it's Yarborough to the inside, taking the lead. Dan Bright screaming down off the fourth turn in the record book as the winner of the 19th annual day on a 500. Kale Yarborough is an athlete's athlete, an all-state football player. He decided racing was what he wanted to do, along with several other things. When struck by lightning in his living room, he once fell out of an airplane with only a loose arm hold and a parachute, which half opened and dumped him hard in a freshly plowed field. He walked away. he jumped off an 80-foot high platform into a swimming hole and landed on a large surprised alligator. Oh, there's so many stories. He was the only man to win three consecutive Winston Cup championships. The country's top drivers ready their cars for the 160 miles of beach and bumpy road. All the cars are just as they came from the factory with absolutely no changes. The same cars you drive on America's highways. The starter's flag is up. 
and 48 late model automobiles zoom past the starting line. As they speed by, see if you can spot the family car. Almost every American make is represented. You'd get arrested for going this fast on a superhighway, and you'd get to the hospital if you tried it on the kind of road these drivers are following. The beach is the smoothest part of the course until the speed merchants get it chewed up enough to make things interesting. From sand to macadam. And if you don't think that isn't hard on the car, try it sometime. But make sure your trunk is fastened before you do it. The boys really pour it on in the straightaways. And along this stretch, they hit more than 100 miles per hour. At the halfway mark, Fireball Roberts, driving a Buick Century, has taken the lead, but Tim Flux Chrysler 300 is right behind. The rest of the pack follows in close pursuit, but the leaders are setting a torrid pace. Roberts and Flock have both been averaging more than 92 miles per hour. Fireball Roberts is in car M1 and moving up to lap the field. Tim Flock in car number 300 isn't far behind and both are on their way to a new record. Roberts qualified with a speed of more than 121 miles per hour. Block, who was disqualified after finishing first last year, led all qualifiers with a speed of 130 miles per hour. Not bad for a stock car that hasn't been souped up. Heading into the last lap, Fireball Roberts pushes the accelerator to the floor and barrels across the finish line in one hour, 43 and eight seconds for the 160 miles. Tim Flock, however, is awarded first place because the inspectors who examine each car after the race found that the motor of Robert's car had been altered. Roberts has to give back that beautiful trophy and what's tougher, the winner's check. When the super speedways in Daytona, later Charlotte and Atlanta join Darlington on NASCAR's schedule, race attendance grew rapidly and new, bigger-than-life heroes suddenly became household names. The first to attract national, even international attention was a clean-cut youngster from Florida who earned his nickname for his prowess as a baseball pitcher. It was Daytona Beach's Edward Glenn Roberts, Fireball Roberts, who thrilled spectators with his hard-charging style. Once they made him start, a half a lap behind the field in the parking lot, and he won. In the mid-80s, the superstars, Bill Elliott, the popular Georgia redhead, who captured the $1 million Winston bonus in an outstanding 85 season, earning the nickname Million Dollar Bill. And three-time Winston Cup champion Dale Earnhardt was born into the sport. And even before his father, the legendary Ralph Earnhardt, won NASCAR's late model sportsman title, Dale Earnhardt had already informed his parents of a plan to one day be a race car driver, an intention he had made known when he was five years old. Racing to me is enjoyable. The only time I'm happy is when I'm in a race car racing. Uh, uh, the part that gets uh, tedious and, and tough is the traveling back and forth and the, and the places we have to go. Sometimes we're in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the next week we'll be in Riverside, California. So we switch back and forth to a lot of places. And that's the toughest part of my job, really, is, uh, is the traveling. With the time I'm having a good time and enjoying myself when I'm on that racetrack racing. Earnhardt sharpened his skills on the short tracks in the Southland for five years before moving up to the Major League Winston Cup Arena. He made his entrance with dramatic flair, winning the 1979 Rookie of the Year title and his first Winston Cup championship in 1980. By 1987, Earnhardt had moved to the head of the class. The 1987 season in NASCAR continued to show a growth in spectators, sponsorships, and purses. The Winston Cup Championship was clinched at North Carolina Motor Speedway in October, but it was also a year when a lot of new young faces began to appear, starting with the 10th place finisher in the Winston Cup battle, car number 90, driven by Missouri's Ken Schrader. The 1985 NASCAR Champion Spark Plug Rookie of the Year won the 125-mile qualifying race at Daytona. Finishing ninth in the Winston Cup standings in 1987 was Bobby Allison, 
the 1983 Winston Cup champion scored one victory at Daytona's Pepsi Firecracker 400, giving him 83 career victories, tying him with Cale Yarborough. Next, the King, seven-time Winston Cup champion Richard Petty. Flying the STP colors, he's captured 200 victories in a career that can only be labeled remarkable. But another Petty has emerged in the top ten. Richard's son, Kyle, finishing seventh in the 87-point battle. Kyle won the longest race of the year, the World 600 at Charlotte Motor Speedway. With Kyle's preparation and dedication, it appears the Petty name will be around for generations to come. Six in the Winston Cup standings, Ricky Rudd. Driving the Bud Moore prepared Motorcraft Ford, Ricky captured two 500-mile events, the Motorcraft 500 at Atlanta and the Delaware 500 at Dover Downs. Next came the 1984 Champion Sparkplug Rookie of the Year, Rusty Wallace. He's comfortable on the Super Speedway high banks, but he's really at home on road courses, capturing the Riverside Winston Western 500 and the annual Bud at the Glen in Watkins Glen, New York. Three-time Winston Cup champion Darrell Walter finished fourth. The all-time leading money winner in NASCAR won the Goodies 500 at Martinsville, driving the Tide-sponsored Rick Hendrick machine. Third in the Winston Cup standings was the Iceman, Terry Labonte. Driving the Junior Johnson-prepared Budweiser Chevrolet, he won the Holly Farms 400 at North Wilkesboro Speedway. The 1984 Winston Cup champion is from Corpus Christi, Texas. The Winston Cup champion boiled down to two drivers as the 1987 season wound down. Bill Elliott fell short in his efforts to shoot down the top gun. He won six Winston Cup events in 87, including the prestigious Daytona 500. Dale Earnhardt earned the title top gun by winning 11 events in the Richard Childress owned Chevrolet to claim the Winston Cup championship title for the third time. In 1987, he was also voted the American Driver of the Year. Throughout the course of the season, it was obvious. Earnhardt was number one. He is the Winston Cup's top gun. He's been going to the races ever since he was a kid. Now he's leaving the field just like his daddy did. From Daytona to Atlanta, anywhere they race. Earnhardt is setting the pace So run to the front Don't look back That Wrangler Chevrolet Is charging through the pack When that green flag falls He'll be chasing you top gun So run to the front He'll run Run to the front He'll run The checkered flag is falling here comes old number three, carrying Dale to another victory. The fans are all standing, yelling, you're number one. Iron heart, you're the champion. Cause you run to the front, you don't look back. That Wrangler Chevrolet is burning up the track. They can't catch the man, they call Top Gun. NASCAR is more than the Winston Cup. From a humble beginning, NASCAR in 87 has grown to 28,000 members, more than 100 sanctioned tracks in 41 states, and conducted over 1,400 races on weekly tracks across America. NASCAR is number one in the world of international motorsports. Has NASCAR reached the peak? Are they there? The president of NASCAR, Bill France, Jr. We're uh, striving to make it bigger and better. And based on our indication as of now, it's, uh, this coming season looks like it ought to be a, a great year. The NASCAR story is more than a tale of high-powered machines. It is a chronicle of men from Big Bill France and the innovative stock car racing pioneers who joined him at that historic meeting. To Lee Petty and his family, and other proud families, like the Bakers, the 
Allisons, the Jarretts, the Earnharts. Tim Flock, Curtis Turner, Fireball Roberts, Fearless Freddie Lorenzo. They opened the doors to the future. David Pearson, Richard Petty, Cale Yarborough, and Bobby Allison who made the transition so exciting, so colorful. The men and women who worked so long, so hard, thousands of loyal crew members at the backbone of every team. The engineers from Detroit. Goodyear and Unicam. The legion of dedicated sponsor representatives who delivered Big Bill's dream to America's marketplace. Men and women working together to build the most popular form of motorsports in the world. The national news media and the ever-growing attention it pays to a sport that proudly wears a Made in the USA label. Dale Earnhardt, Darrell Walter, and Bill Ellett, the current heroes who thrill sellout crowds Sunday after Sunday. Rising stars like Ken Schrader, Kyle Petty, Davey Allison, Ricky Rudd, Sterling Marlin, who will carry the rich legacy of Winston Cup racing to the future. And especially, the loyal spectators who have made the incredible NASCAR dream come true with their unyielding support. It is a high-powered, brightly painted sport to be sure. But in the hands of hard-working, highly motivated, dedicated men and women, it becomes a tribute to the old-fashioned spirit of America. Yes, the NASCAR story is a human story of people with fierce determination and pride who work together to turn their dreams into a reality.
today in Dr. Linden's office, 